for this official U.S. launch of China's strong arm protecting citizens and assets abroad. Uh, we are very fortunate to be jo joined by uh, one of the co-authors of the text, as well as uh, Yun Sun, who's uh, based here in Washington at the Simpson Center. Uh, Jonas Perello Plesner uh, is based at the Danish Embassy here in Washington, co-wrote this uh, with Matthew. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that last name. My French is terrible. Thank you. Uh, we had the two of them together to launch the book uh, in Singapore at the end of May at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Uh, very well received there. Uh, we've been working to make sure we can do something uh, with Jonas here in Washington since he's uh, based here, uh, at least for now. Uh, and we are fortunate enough to have uh, Yoon, who is both mentioned and thanked as a reference uh, in the book, but also an expert on Chinese foreign policy. Uh, so it seems like a perfect combination to have both one of the authors and uh, an expert commentator on uh, Chinese foreign policy issues. So uh, I'm going to shut up, let Jonas tell you a little bit about the book, uh, and then we'll have some uh, response and feedback from Yoon, and then open up the floor to Q&A. So thank you all again for coming. Uh, Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bryce, and thanks a lot for making uh, this possible. I mean, it's great. I actually didn't know that before that ISS also had an office here in Washington, so it's also my, my first here. And uh, sort of a big thanks to the whole team behind ISS that sort of back when I was in a, in a think tank, the European Council of Foreign Relations, uh, believed in the idea that was to become a book. It took, as our books always do, quite a lot longer than, uh, than I expected. And at the time we came out here, I'm here in a different position. So just the first a disclaimer of saying that uh, this, of course, is just my own views and not those of my current empl employer, uh, the Danish uh, government. But uh, a project that I started on when I, I was back with uh, the think tank, European Council on uh, of Foreign Relations. Um, and did this together with Monsieur Duchatel, who is uh, head of uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm Institute of uh, Peace Re Research Institute out in uh, Beijing. And um, um, a renowned Sinologist who has also been working on sort of uh, how does uh, it affect China to uh, the fact of having more and more nationals abroad. Um, and my own sort of, I think one of the interests got sparked back when uh, in 2011 when I wrote about the Libya evacuation and, and saw this as a sort of watershed for, uh, for China. And then having as a sort of diplomat myself worked on, on sort of uh, in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs on evacuations and back uh, the tsunami in 2004 and in 2006 in, in Lebanon. So I thought, okay, here's something that's a really interesting topic to see how that develops in um, in, uh, in China. So basically, uh, I mean, the book's sort of main theme and hypothesis is about China's increasing capacity and uh, to protect nationals and assets abroad and what effect that has on Chinese foreign policy. Um, and what we see is both an increased capacity and sort of willingness to, uh, to do this. As an example, here in March 2015, quite recently, uh, for us, quite fortunate when uh, <laughs> The book just came out, so it's actually, I think, on the, on the first page, you had two Chinese frigates in, um, that evacuated uh, 629 Chinese citizens, <coughs> as well as 279 other foreign nationals from the war-torn uh, Yemen. Uh, this was a pretty historic move for, uh, for China, uh, since it was the first time you'd seen the People's Liberation Army and the Navy uh, conducting such a sort of non-combat -co um, evacuation operation alone. And also one of the first time that China sort of rescued um, other foreign nationals. Uh, so it did demonstrate sort of China's growing capacity to protect its national in faraway places. Uh, I think China's ambassador to Yemen uh, even sort of uh, was quoted in China Daily as showing this shows a reflection of a significant growth in China's comprehensive national power. Um, and actually Going back to Shangri-La, where we launched it uh, the first time in, in Singapore, uh, the highest ranking, um, uh, the leader of the Chinese delegation, Admiral Sun, was also referring to the Yemen evacuation as an example of how sort of Chinese more global military presence was a sort of benign thing for the world and, and, and sort of could help out others, particularly because uh, the Chinese Navy had rescued not just Chinese citizens, but also broader uh, Western and other citizens. Um, so what we see is that non-combatant evacuation have become a sort of standard practice in crisis overseas. Uh, China has conducted 17 of these in the past decade. And in 2011, uh, China rescued more than 47,000 Chinese abroad. And that was more in a single year than in the previous decades of the People's Republic. Um, 
and China can be said to sort of adopted a uh, uh, principle of uh, responsibility to protect, but a responsibility to protect of its own citizens uh, overseas. Um, and sort of the formal concept of protecting nationals abroad was added to the uh, Communist Party sort of nomenclatura and priority list in uh, at the 18 Party Congress in in 2012, as uh, President Xi and um, uh, Premier Li Keqiang um, assumed control of the Chinese government. Um, in 2013, in the White Paper on Defense, it was all the, the protection of nationals also mentioned. It was again here um, uh, this year. Um, so, what, and what's the background to this? I mean, it is what we, in the, in the book, where we talk about there's a new sort of global risk map for, for China. Chinese companies and Chinese workers and <coughs> tourists are all over the globe. Uh, we already see China in the top tier among foreign uh, investors in, uh, with over huge overseas investments. You have Chinese companies in hot pursuit of oil and natural resources abroad, particularly in Africa. I think Yun has also written about uh, this. And so China has left a few regions of the world unexplored uh, and is now promoting the construction of a new Silk Road uh, from Asia to foreign markets in Europe. And I think that as well will in entail much more of Chinese workers and, and, and companies, of course, also going abroad. Here we see a fundamental tension between a sort of Chinese foreign policy, government policy that's much more risk averse in, in how to get involved in other countries' affairs and then risk, much more risk prone companies uh, and individual and, and Chinese entrepreneurs willing to, uh, to go abroad to seek um, uh, fortunes. So um, the estimates we work in uh, within the book is that there are more around 5 million um, Chinese nationals abroad uh, with more than uh, 2 million in sort of unstable parts of, uh, of Africa. What we did find, though, and we've tracked this for a long time, it's that it's very hard to actually do, to find these numbers. It's very hard to. So I'll give a couple of examples. For example, in the Libya evacuation, that we where we did a lot of interviews in uh, in Beijing and elsewhere with Chinese officials, and what they initially had estimated was there was 6,000 people in Libya, and it showed there was much more than 35,000. So I mean, so you see that sort of element of. Um, of lack of sort of data that even the official China doesn't necessarily have it. And there is a, an interplay here also probably sometimes between the companies that are not necessarily interested in reporting how many they, they have in a country and the government that of course knows that they can get dragged into problems with, uh, with large numbers. Another case would be Angola where uh, during uh, Li Keqiang's visit the number that he gave and was quoted was 200,000 and when, when there were sort of public discussion and I think the official number that the embassy has is like 10 times lower. So again, there you see uh, even inside the Chinese system sort of the uh, incongruence on, on the numbers. Um, anyway, as mentioned, we see the Chinese sort of companies really mass scale going abroad. I can mention China's three sort of oil majors of Sinopec, CNPC, and CNOC. Um, also sort of the largest Chinese company by uh, FDI. And they, of course, have been seeking opportunities in countries where there's less international competition, uh, such as Sudan, uh, Libya, uh, Myanmar, Burma, and Iran. Uh, so several of these countries are quite sort of fragile. Um, so these engagement by the companies, of course, entail new foreign policy conundrums for the risk-averse Chinese government. Um, in the book, we quote uh, some Chinese scholars uh, that were talking about sort of a hijacking of Chinese foreign policy by, uh, by the companies of thereby putting sort of uh, their interest uh, in front of the, of the government. Um, so with the case of Angola that I just mentioned with the 200,000, I mean that sort of leads to that there are some countries now that are sort of uh, too big to fail for China, basically where uh, when there's crisis China somehow has to get involved simply because uh, that the, the going out strategy, which is the commercial sort of strategy of getting Chinese companies to go out abroad, has to be sort of squared with much more broader uh, strategic uh, calculations. So that's what we try to make in, in this one here, which I think you've all got as a hand, uh, handout, which is sort of the, the risk map where we both show attacks on Chinese citizens and show evacuations and, uh, and, and sort of where China has a strong uh, presence. So that sort of is one way of sort of illustrating um, this sort of new global risk map that I've been, uh, that I've been talking about. Um, 
Um, I have a little bit to talk about what we do in the book, where we look inside the Chinese machinery of like what state um, uh, institutions are involved in this. The, the, the Waijiabu, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the Gonganbu, the Chinese Ministry of Public Security, and how some of these interact on, on different, of course, the military as well. But uh, I think we can also go into Q&A uh, to talk more about that. But that's one of the chapters as well, um, which I recommend when you uh, hopefully get to read it. And, but let me rather than turn to uh, the cases that we look at, because that's the other part then of the, of the book, is this the overall picture uh, that we draw, but then we look at sort of specific cases. And we look at um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, which has been one of the really sort of early danger zones for uh, Chinese workers, where there's both been kidnappings and killings, and was probably also in 2004 when there was both uh, killings of Chinese um, nationals in Pakistan simultaneously uh, shortly afterwards in Sudan as well that sort of woke up the Chinese government to it that there's a new uh, there's a new risk here in in, in, in having a uh, big uh, commercial uh, projects uh, abroad um, and we look at how that also gradually sort of impinges on Chinese foreign policy and how that for example both leads to demands on the host country for much more protection. We see that in Pakistan, where now with uh, the new, uh, uh, not with the new Silk Road, but with the project's economic corridor um, that the Chinese are planning to, to build, that uh, the, the Pakistani are now planning to have a sort of special army force of 10,000 that is, is, is supposed to take care of, uh, of Chinese workers. Uh, and that, of course, is a, is a way of, of making sure that Chinese assets are, uh, are protected. We see it in Afghanistan with a much more sort of engagement actually these days in, in the mediation process that, uh, that China realizes when the US and when Western forces will be completely out of the country, uh, it will be uh, in its backyard uh, with also Chinese investments and, uh, um, and some much more limited human presence in, in Afghanistan and has therefore engaged in, in mediation effort which for Chinese diplomacy normally um, <coughs> much more sort of uh, non-interference uh, embedded is, is also quite a sort of a novel step. Then we look at Libya, which is uh, the, the big case where in 12 days in late, late February in, uh, in, uh, and early March 2011, China removed more than 35,000 uh, workers by plane, ship, bus and uh, truck in uh, the sort of turmoil that uh, happened during uh, the fall of uh, Gaddafi's uh, regime. Then uh, we look at uh, the Mekong uh, River, where in 2011 there was uh, killings uh, on the river of uh, 13 uh, Chinese um, sailors that sparked a lot of outrage inside uh, China, because particularly because the sailors had been sort of killed in a quite uh, uh, brutal uh, way. And I think that highlights the fact that there is also now a completely sort of different public expectation that China has a bigger country in the Chinese population that China is capable now of protecting its, its, uh, uh, its citizens, its nationals uh, abroad. Uh, so we saw that quite uh, much in, um, in, that in, in the case of the, uh, the Mekong River killings. It also showed the Ministry of Public Security, which was quite much in the lead on, on that case. It did have that sort of interesting uh, sidekick to it that there was talk about uh, in, an inter in a Chinese interview the Ministry of Public Security gave about that they had thought about using a drone to catch the alleged um, killer of the Chinese sailor, Nao Khan, who is a sort of Burmese um, uh, kingpin uh, uh, of drugs in the sort of uh, Golden Triangle up in the, the Mekong River. And that never came to fruition, but that, of course, would have been a quite big step for, for Chinese foreign policy if, if China has employed uh, a drone in a sort of lethal way uh, beyond its borders. But what did happen was that uh, China, uh, working very closely together with um, local authorities in the other countries, and particularly pushed hard on Laos and Burma, um, uh, managed in a joint police operation to catch Nao Khan, brought him to China, and uh, had a relatively brief court case, and he was afterwards executed, uh, which in a sense is a first in the sense that the the crime was committed outside of China's uh, borders against Chinese uh, nationals, and uh, uh, he was then sort of brought back to, um, to China. Uh, then we look at the Sudans, um, where Chinese state-owned companies ventured in the beginning exclusively for oil, but uh, subsequently, uh, with the rest of the Chinese government, uh, had to deal with attacks on Chinese nationals, 
and unwanted sort of foreign policy conundrums such as uh, South Sudanese independence. Um, but the commercial and human presence uh, is what we see is that that has sort of gradually led to a more proactive Chinese uh, approach to securing national interest. Um, it has now extended to fielding Chinese combat troops as part of the, um, the UN uh, mission, the UNMIS mission in, in, in South Sudan. Um, and China actually, when there was a revision of the mandate uh, here last year in, in New York, got inserted that, uh, um, that the UNMIS also has sort of protection of uh, oil workers as part of its mandate. And of course, these are pre predominantly uh, Chinese that are still in the in the oil fields in in, in South Sudan. Um, there are historical parallels to all this. That's where our title uh, comes in China's uh, strong arm. I mean, in the in the 19th century, the commercial adventures of uh, the East India Company compelled the British state to to intervene abroad. And here in the U.S., just as the U.S. built the Panama Canal in, in 1914, as it tiptoed into towards great power status. A Chinese company is now aiming to build this sort of big super canal through uh, Nicaragua to be completed by 2020 at an estimated cost of $49 uh, billion. And just as involvement in Panama presented the US with sensitive foreign policy uh, questions, including ownership of the area and the rights of local inhabitants, Chinese construction in Nicaragua could well create challenges way beyond just the financial cost of the operation. So again, with the historical examples, in 1850, Britain's Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston, and that's where the quote comes from with the, the strong arm, uh, ordered the British Navy into the Aegean to protect the British subject on Pacifico and reclaim his sort of lost property. And Palmerston then sort of compared British subjects to citizens of ancient Rome, who could proudly assert the right by announcing, Civis uh, Romanus Sum, I'm a Roman citizen. Um, and according to Palmerston, he was in saying a British subject in whatever land he may be shall feel confident in the watchful eye and the strong arm of England will protect him from injustice and wrong. And so what we're looking at is that similar events like the ones we've just sort of depicted in the book will continue to shape China's approach to international intervention and power protection with the, uh, with, um, the protection of nationals overseas as a major driver of foreign policy uh, change. Um, and as China's sort of commercial and human presence continue to expand, and particularly now with the, with the new Silk Road, which is going to be, if completed fully, a massive project around the, almost around the whole globe, uh, the Chinese state will, of course, be uh, compelled to sort of uh, tag on to protect uh, these interests. So basically, sort of studying China's new risk map, uh, as we do here in this book, uh, sort of offers indication of how China may behave on its uh, path to, um, to great power status. And um, um, maybe one last point about that. Yeah, I think we would see that China is, it, what does it mean for us in the, in the West and in, uh, in the US and in Europe? I think we will see that there are sort of, in a way, two possible angles. One is that you will see China much more open to multilateral interventions when their own interests are also at stake. Uh, something that we, for example, you could detect in, in South Sudan, where you could say China is c contributing to a global public good by contributing peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping forces and uh, uh, as part of the UN. It could even imagine, now that I mentioned Angola, in, a, in an early stage of the book, we actually had these sort of scenarios which ended up being drafted out by the, uh, the editor, but where we had sort of what could happen in different sort of cases. And we'd put in Angola of saying, imagine a sort of civil strife unrest broke out in China, which is 200,000 uh, workers and massive uh, commercial presence would be perhaps be the one clamoring in the United Nations Security Council for an international reaction, where the rest of the, of the West occupied elsewhere in, um, would be maybe less sort of less uh, open to, uh, to, getting, uh, to getting involved. So all in all, I mean, the magnetic pull of these sort of interests um, abroad will be a defining uh, uh, characteristic of, uh, uh, of Chinese foreign policy over the, the coming years. Great. John, so that's a, a really great summary of an excellent book. I, I encourage you all to, uh, to read it. Turning to you, you've now had a chance to, to read the book. Yes, uh, very carefully. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the state is uh, measuring up in terms of catching up to uh, 
the state-owned enterprises dragging it into some of these situations and no. possibly if there are any uh, other scenarios you could envision or, or cases that might be uh, apropos but Absolutely. Uh, please your, your, your remarks. Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to read the book uh, by Jonas and Matthew and have the opportunity to comment on it. To begin with, I would say that this book perhaps represents the most thorough and comprehensive study to date on the four cases of Chinese government's active protection of its uh, overseas nationals in the past decade. And the authors keenly captured a key changing momentum in China's foreign policy and dug into the historical records and historical narratives to present the readers with a very vivid picture of China's evolving decision-making process on these issues and the policy responses in light, uh, in light of the security threats to Chinese citizens in unstable and volatile countries. In particular, the authors conducted, I can, I can tell from the, from the details, a large number of uh, field research and large few, uh, number of uh, interviews with Chinese officials and, and scholars, which is very important in providing valuable empirical evidence to the cases they sought to build. Because of that, the book adds great value to the existing studies on the implications of China's growing <coughs> overseas investment and business activities and should be a must read, read for China watchers in the policy community as well as for students or anyone who is trying to understand China's foreign interventionist behaviors. The book evolves around a one central question, which is what is China's policy response toward the rising security threats to the growing number of Chinese nationals and assets abroad? As the authors rightly observed, China's global footprint has enhanced greatly in the past 20 years. First, as a result of the reform and opening up policy started in uh, 1979, and later was then expedited by the going out strategy since the year 2000 to uh, promote foreign trade to seek natural resources in order to fuel China's domestic economic growth. Although the official number of overseas Chinese nationals does not seem to exist, I very much <laughs> agree with you, um, the rough estimate of 5 million Chinese passport holders perhaps significantly underestimate the, the, true, uh, the real number. For example, uh, using Chinese overseas students as an example, we know that according to Chinese government statistics, in the past 30 years there have been more than 3 million Chinese students studying abroad, and 60% of them choose not to go back to China. So even there, we see very easily 2 million Chinese nationals coming out of China, leaving other countries. But of course, there is a possibility that they later choose to naturalize into the citizens of another country. Um, but then in terms of Chinese nationals working overseas, either for foreign companies or for Chinese companies' overseas projects, the number is even larger. According to the author's observation, generally speaking, China's policy response to protect its nationals could be categorized into the following five categories. The first one is to enhance the central government's organizational capacity and the crisis ma management capacity in consular protection, which was clearly demonstrated in the case of the Libya evacuation. The second category is uh, by promoting local country governments to protect the Chinese assets, workers and uh, other nationals. And this is uh, exemplified in the case of Afghanistan and Pakistan. The third category is to pursue joint law enforcement with local countries on the uh, crimes against the Chinese nationals, such as in the case of the Mekong River ma Massacre. The fourth category is to rely on multilateral institutions such as UN and UN peacekeeping missions, such as in the case of the escort missions in the Gulf of Aden and in the case of South Sudan. Furthermore, China is also seeking to enhance its risk management procedures for Chinese companies internally. And NDRC and the Ministry of Commerce, they have come up with a lot of instructions and suggestions as well how Chinese companies could prevent some of the risk from happening in the first place. Um, and China is also trying to diversify its relationship with local political actors in volatile countries to hedge against pot potential uh, security risks. Those lessons were learned in a difficult way for China in the case of Libya, and the China's policy adjustments since then have been transpired themselves in the more recent cases of um, Syria 
and Afghanistan today. The book raised some long-term strategic questions about China's foreign policy. First of all, what are the implications of the rising need and actions of China to protect its overseas interests for China's foreign policy posture in the long run? In other words, as the rest of the world, we witness China's increasing assertiveness in defending what Beijing perceives to be its core national interest. Will China's decisive actions to, pr to protect its people overseas translate into a more aggressive, offensive, unilateral foreign policy posture? On this issue, the answer seems to be a little ambiguous. Like Yunus pointed out, there are two possibilities. As the author um, pointed out in the, uh, in the introduction section, in becoming more deeply involved on the world stage, China has mainly reacted to events on the ground, rather than seizing opportunities to expand its political influence and power globally. So the message sent by this statement is that China's overall posture has remained to be defensive in nature on issues of overseas protection and the assertive actions were necessitated by the situation rather than the other way around, meaning that China facilitated the creation of this those situation in order to expand China's military or security influence overseas. So either in the case of Africa or in Afghanistan, China's involvement was made necessary by its economic investments and the nationals on the ground. So therefore, China's reaction so far has also been restricted to the protection of these interests. However, on the other side, this also leads to another intri intriguing question as for whether China in the future will use will adopt the same defensive posture, or instead, China will use the issue of protecting its nationals and assets to advance its other national interests. And on that, the answer seems to be far less clear at this, uh, at this stage. I would say there's a possibility of that scenario of China's unilaterally using a security or military influence to advance its other, um, using the protection of Chinese nationals as an excuse to advance China's national interest seems to be low, although it cannot be ruled out. And there has been incidents or examples of China adopting that approach. I'll give you an example, um, such as in the case of Vietnam's anti-China riot in 2014. China's response was, uh, was at least partially motivated by and aimed at strengthening its position in the South China Sea dispute with Vietnam um, in the aftermath of the, uh, in the handling of the anti-China riots. But on the, on the issue of anti-China riots, we also see a little bit of um, double standard on Beijing's part. For example, in the Vietnamese anti-China riot, um, China demanded compensation for the Chinese workers hurt and for the Chinese factories that were damaged during the, uh, during, the riot, uh, during the riot. And in fact, the Vietnamese government did provide about, I think, seven million US dollars in compensation to Taiwanese and Chinese companies. But on the other hand, in the anti-Japan riots in China, um, back in 2012, where major Japanese companies, um, shops and assets were damaged on the ground and Japanese government made a similar claim that Chinese government should make the compensation. Um, Beijing basically completely shut the door on the Japanese government's face. So let's go back. Well, people have great doubts about China's non-interference principle and its applic applicability in the protection of overseas Chinese citizens and assets. So this is also an issue that this book covers a lot. What does it mean for China's non-interference principle? The concern is that if China begins to interfere with other ch countries' internal affairs, it would signify a major shift of uh, China's foreign policy and the so-called China's uh, peaceful rise or peaceful development. In the Chinese perspective, however, this does not necessarily have to happen. And here is their explanation. In the Chinese view, the non-interference principle should have a scope of application. That is, the issue at hand in foreign country should not affect or damage China's national interest on the ground. Otherwise, their argument is no country should or would simply sit aside and do nothing and watch their either political, security, or economic interests get trampled over. As identified by the, uh, by the Chinese, there are at least three differences between the Chinese interpretation of non-interference and the hard version of, uh, of interference of uh, interference of other countries' internal affairs that China tries to avoid. The first difference is um, on issue other than the evacuation of uh, Chinese nationals or this uh, rescuing mission of Chinese nationals. 
China relies mostly on quiet access, quietly exercising its influence for private conversations or persuasions, or simply to show the local governments or political actors the negative consequences of their of their behavior if they do not listen to China China's advice. So they would call this is a not open intervention. This is more of a quiet persuasion approach. The second difference that they identify is China's using of its influence does not go beyond the scope of protecting Chinese interest. And China does not seek to dictate the local country's policy, especially the political issue on, on political issues or on economic policies. And the third difference that the Chinese would identify is China does not threaten with military intervention or economic sanctions if the local governments refuse to honor China's demands or requests. So these three differences is what the Chinese analysts would argue that fundamentally distinguish China's interference or, um, and the non-interference that China tries to, um, tries to honor. In the case of military interventions, the Chinese would first of all draw a difference, a distinction between the concept of intervention and interference. So in the Chinese view, multilateral intervention with UN mandate are legitimate because it has the approval and the support of the UN Security Council and reflects the consensus among, among countries in the world. And this is in sharp contrast to the unilateral interference of other countries' domestic affairs that China tries to avoid. Meanwhile, such interventions, um, for example, the UN peacekeeping mission, usually has local countries' consent. So it is not entirely imposed or arbitrary in China's perception. So although issues such as China's contribution of combat troops in Mali and in South Sudan have raised eyebrows internationally about China's potential overseas military uh, deployment, at least in the Chinese policy community, the correlation between the two variables is extremely low. There is also a difference between the protection of Chinese nationals and the protection of Chinese assets. Um, and the Chinese government's approach to these two different issues are also very different. As the book have discussed, on protecting Chinese nationals, Beijing does not hesitate to exhaust any possibilities or any resources that's necessary. This is demonstrated particularly in the case of the Libya evacuation. However, on the other hand, the actions that China has taken on protecting China's overseas economic interests seems to have lagged far behind. South Sudan is perhaps the most prominent case where China's entrenched oil assets put China into the conflict and this resolution. But even there, uh, some Chinese analysts and officials have pointed out that the crude oil that China has extracted from the oil uh, fields in South Sudan has already made up for China's initial investments. So even now, even if China has to stop its operation, oil operation in South Sudan completely, China has already, CNPC has already broken even. So in other cases, such as the suspension of China's mega hydropower dam in, uh, in Myanmar, and the suspension of China's ANAC copper mine in Afghanistan, Chinese government's push for the recovery, uh, for the for the re, um, resumption of the China, uh, for the recovery of the Chinese company's losses is marginal and min minimal. Therefore, I would say that despite Chinese companies' attempt to hijack China's foreign policy, there is a limit to how much Beijing would do. And Beijing has demonstrated a tendency of preferring the companies to resort to legal approach to resolve the commercial disputes in a commercial manner. And this is clearly demonstrated in the cases of the cancellation of the high-speed railways in both Philippines um, back in 2012 and in Mexico earlier this year. The book touched upon the motivation of China adopting a more strong-armed policy in overseas protection and attributed to, attributed to this, um, this change to the rising domestic nationalism and the public opinion inside China. I saw the causality or the correlation between the two variable, between the Chinese domestic politics and the foreign policy behaviors deserve a little bit more elaboration because the ability to protect its citizens is essentially a question of regime legitimacy for Beijing, especially for the Communist Party regime whose legitimacy does not rely upon democratic election. It is particularly vulnerable toward criticisms on its regime credibility and capability. In, indeed, in the cases of uh, Libya evacuation and the Mekong law enforcement, Beijing's success 
was repeatedly emphasized by the domestic media to boost the Communist Party government's popularity among its people. And in comparison, the less successful cases of South Sudan and Afghanistan and Pakistan have received much less publicity in China. The issue is important in that as China's domestic politics evolve, it is going to have a determining effect over China's foreign policy behavior. And hypothetically, a Chinese government that is more confident about its uh, regime security and legitimacy will foreseeably, possibly, be more sensible and less emotional and less aggressive about the missions to protect its nationals abroad. So where does this go? The answer, uh, the, the authors provided a few possible answers, such as uh, China could have more unilateral actions, could have greater military involvement in the, uh, in the global conflicts, China could have uh, unprecedented foreign policy adjustment, or China could have greater cooperation with the Western countries on safeguarding stability in, fra in fragile states. So we hope it is the last one. But in the case of China, usually the result is a combination of a lot of, uh, of, of, a lot of possibilities. And the, um, we, we certainly hope the authors will keep following this issue and give us the update in the near future. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I know well, one that you mentioned briefly in the conclusion of the book. Discussion about what China. Ethnic Chinese uh, mm. world. Can you discuss how that kind of came up during the? the sure. Conflict? I mean, well, it came up, of course, because Putin in, in invaded and annexed Crimea, and then afterwards had that speech on, on sort of protecting ethnic Russians abroad, and we, of course, sort of then looked into how it is. Which, again, I would underline, China right now is very far from that. I mean, it's much more of a, of a low-key type of uh, approach to protecting its um, it, its nationals, but also uh, there's a question of who is a national. I mean, and of course, in the Chinese case, if you looked at like what is the same here in, in with Russia, ethnic Russians abroad, and there are more than around 50 million overseas Chinese. So of course, if you suddenly had an extension of a protective umbrella from China, first of all, it would be quite tough for the Chinese government. But probably, if we square has much more to say um, or expect sort of the, the regime to deliver on protection of, of Chinese overseas, maybe there there wouldn't be that big difference. Had the 13 sailors in on the Mekong in uh, been of Chinese origin but Burmese, maybe the public reaction would have been the same. And I think we see it a little bit in the case now with, with Myanmar and the, the sort of border, border incursions and what, what's happening there were it's it's not necessarily Chinese citizens, but uh, but uh, ethnic Chinese that live inside uh, Burma. But there's more and more of so the demand of 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 sort of uh, that China should take an active uh, take an active stance. So, but again, I mean, the, we outlined so that's more would be the sort of the negative center of seeing China moving in a sort of Russian direction. Isn't its nationals for very sort of and using that as a lever for influence. And what we see just as much as, as the other part of where it does basically lead China to have a growing bandwidth with the West on stabilization that, uh, and to sometimes uh, accept some things that they probably wouldn't otherwise. I mean, I think the South Sudanese uh, in the referendum and independent is a great example because, I mean, you have China that normally, because of Taiwan, is quite uh, sort of opposed to any type of sort of succession in, uh, inside. So, they, I mean, uh, there were even 15 Chinese sort of observers, uh, uh, referendum ex election observers from a country that doesn't hold uh, elections, apart from at local level, to be fair to China, um, but where there's only one party you can vote for. And, um, and well, again, technically, there are several parties, but uh, there's only one party that matters. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, so you, we, we see, I think, see sort of both, which we outline that there is both that sort of uh, element of, of increased cooperation and where, where, where China, not because it has any desire like us for sort of democratic governance, but basically because instability harms its interest. And, uh, 
Um, so it also learned one thing that we highlight in the book. It's learned much more again to uh, speak with rebels again that uh, it has had, which is actually not that long ago, because during Mao there were all the sort of, you had all the, the, um, the support for insurgency groups around the world, but then during sort of Deng Xiaoping, non-interference has been very interpreted as having relations with the government and nobody else. And that has been changing, particularly in sort of in unstable countries where China has been seeing, hey, we need to also be able to, who are the next power holders? Libya. Uh, was a good example where they came quite late, but in recognizing the transitional uh, council, and the Russians actually moved in just before them, and they were they were left as the last sort of P5 power to recognize. So with Syria, even though in a sense they were still have the formal links with the Assad government, they've taken up links with opposition groups with. I'm into uh, power instead of sort of shunning it. Let's, let's turn the floor. I ask that uh, you wait for the microphone, uh, state your name and your affiliation. Chat, why don't we just take two up in the, the front? We'll just take two first. That's all right. Thank yeah, you. perfect. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Arnold Zeitlin, and I teach in China. Uh, does uh, China's uh, brokering of talks with the Taliban? and its presence on the team negotiating uh, a nuclear agreement with Iran indicate a new dimension to Chinese foreign policy. Um, I think the situation in, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Priscilla Clapp. I'm uh, an advisor to USIP and Asia Society. Um, the situation in Burma may be quite different than all the other things you're looking at because they've got a long um, land border. And um, as you mentioned, there are tribes on that border that are half in China, half in, in Burma. But, but China's also involved in doing things inside Burma, some of which are illegal. And some of those people have been picked up by the Burmese government. And I think it's, it causes confusion, uh, probably with Chinese policy. They've been having to sort that out. And there were probably some Chinese nationals involved in the group that went back in and attacked in Kokong recently. So I think you have a, a much more complex picture there. And if China were to, for example, move into Burma in the name of protecting some of its citizens, it would be considered a very open form of aggression. Anyway, you can comment on that. It's not really a question, I guess, but yeah, sure. you may have a um, well, on the last, yeah, I, I think you're right, and well, Yuen is much more an expert of, uh, on me on the sort of on uh, on the specific sort of Burma uh, Chinese relations, um, but um, but definitely there is still, and but that comes back to the whether the natural inclination still of the Chinese government is sort of risk averse is not to get involved. So a lot of this is because there's the sort of the pull of either by having nationals abroad, by having sort of the the, the companies abroad, so that we. Um, we see it that way through. So it's not necessarily that there's sort of a grand plan in, in Beijing for saying now let's use this to sort of intervene in in uh, in Burma or elsewhere. On the other, on on the effect on, I mean, in our book, I would say that it's mostly the first case that has a, a relevance: Afghanistan, Pakistan, where I think the fact now that China is trying to invest massively in there, particularly in Pakistan, it it matters for them whether there is sort of reconciliation as well in, in, in uh, Afghanistan. Of course, it also has a domestic link, which we haven't touched upon yet, which is terrorism. The fact that uh, which, uh, Chinese, uh, um, particularly Uyghurs, in, uh, from the Xinjiang province. Uh, and there, I think you'll see China also, in order to protect nationals from sort of also terrorism, apart from the kidnappings the, uh, in unstable areas, he'd be much more willing to sort of uh, be going out. Um, I mean, the highest level visit there was to Afghanistan for, for years was of Zhu Yongkang, which now is mostly known as sort of dethroned party saw, but which was at that time the sort of strong leader of the, um, of the, the public security apparatus. Uh, it was also him who led, who sort of gathered, I would say, with the Mekong River, all the neighboring riparian countries to Beijing and say, come up here and we need to solve this. I mean, our citizens shouldn't be uh, be killed uh, on the river and we have to, uh, and, and got sorted out that these sort of joint river patrols started, which basically when it comes to Burma and Laos is, is run by China. 
Thailand has a little bit more on, of national sovereignty uh, um, uh, behind it. So, uh, so that's the, the Afghanistan and Pakistan is mostly where it touches on. Iran, uh, I think, is more China is a P5 country. It's, that's, that's where it's sort of embedded in, in the negotiation and it's, it's more linked generally to that, that, that China is starting to play a play a role, but you could say, I mean, they're there as well. They're not the part you hear most about as, as part of their, they seem to be a helpful uh, partner in that. So that, of course, gives added to their sort of idea of, of being a, a partner on the international stage and, uh, and another problem themselves. Yeah. Um, on either of those? Sure, sure. On the issue of, uh, of, of Burma, Priscilla, you know it best. Um, I'll just add a little updated information during my um, trip to China and to the border last month. Because uh, earlier this year, in the, at the peak of the, um, the Kokan conflict, at the beginning of April, there was a quite shocking piece coming out of the, Chine uh, the Chinese official media. Um, and in that, in that report is an exclusive interview with a retired PLA general. And the PLA general's father used to be the boss of uh, Xi Jinping so 20, 30 years ago. So he's regarded as someone who carries special uh, strength politically. And in the, he, this guy now is the chairman of the Sino-Myanmar Friendship Association in China. So in this interview, he made a comment. He said, well, uh, the Kokan people in Burma, in Myanmar, they are, they are of Chinese descent. So they are our kings. And when our kings, our relatives, are persecuted in a foreign country, we cannot sit aside and just watch. So that comment really um, rings a bell because it, it is so similar to what Russia said about, about Crimea, and that was a little scary. So um, during my past last month in, in China, I was um, doing research and interview people about what that really means. I said, well, if China regards Kokan people as, as China's relatives, so does that mean that China will interfere in the case of, um, in the, case of the armed conflict with the central government? And they made two uh, very interesting comments. The first comment is, well, you have to understand, relatives can be very far relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be your cousins, they can be your Maybe you were linked to three generations ago. So yes, there are relatives, but we didn't say that they are our brother by blood, right? So there is a major distinction between these two terms. Don't be too over alarmed by the term relatives or kings. And the second com comment on the non-interference principle is, um, is, is very funny. It's, it's like this. Well, we don't interfere with, you, with other countries' internal affairs, but you cannot interfere with our internal affairs either. So when Burma uh, launched the military attacks against the rebels and the cannons exploded um, in, in the Chinese territory and killed the Chinese civilians, it became, a, at least in the Chinese perception, a serious interference or a serious uh, damage um, to China's internal affairs. So they feel that on that issue, that at least it gives them, gives them some legitimacy to have a voice on this, uh, on this issue. But then recently, China also changed its, both its ambassador to, to Myanmar and the special envoy for, for Asian affairs. So there could be some new uh, information coming out. On the issue of Afghanistan, um, I would say that China has maintained the relationship with Pakistan Taliban in Fatah and some, uh, some sections of the Afghanistan Taliban for over a decade. So that relationship has gone, um, could, gone could have gone a very long, um, long history. But it's only recently that China began to play a public role in the negotiation process. And that, I agree with Yunus, was necess necessitated by the withdrawal of, of the United States and of the, uh, the NATO security force. And China now has to face the security challenges, or China thinks that it has to face the security challenges alone, at least uh, in the case of Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. Negotiation in, in Iran, I agree it is part of the P5 responsibility. But if you look at China's track record in promoting or facilitating negotiations on non-proliferation issues, China has been calling for or has been facilitating the six-party talks on, on North Korea for more than a decade, probably two decades now, um, which was not extremely successful, but I would say there is a track record there too. Okay. Great. So we're, we started a little bit late, so we're going to go a little bit after the, the hour. Let's do uh, another two or three questions. Kat, let's start there in the, the back. Just quick questions. 
Thank you. I'm Francis Wilson with the Middle East Institute, and I'm curious what you'd have to say about how China's increasing influence will play into, I guess, the war on terror. For example, before China has largely been able to avoid the attention of um, extre Islamic extremist groups, but with China's increasing protection of its assets and interests abroad, do you see the Crusader Zionist Alliance becoming the Crusader Zionist Alliance and China in terms of enemies of um, Islamic extremism? Probably won't call it that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jin Ling Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Thank you um, for the, the presentation. Would you defend your rhetoric um, argument that China's string is to protect its nationals in the case of the South China Sea? With all the reclamation that is doing, there was no nationals there. And it seemed to me like the most um, effort, the, the, the strongest power that China put in is right around that area in the South China Sea. So would you give us some fact about how many Chinese nationals there? <laughs> and then um, Bryce has raised the question of the Crimea um, situation. And Admiral Harry Harris had also raised that question if China would take that rhetoric to take over part of that area as the case of protecting its ethnics. So in that case, whether you think most Chinese ethnics would be, and what would be the Crimea in that area? Should we go in reverse order this time? Um, uh, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to tackle the first question. It's a, it's a great question. Everyone is interested in what China will do in the, uh, in the campaign against ISIS, uh, ISIS these days. Um, well, from the Chinese perspective, because I do have conversations with Chinese analysts on this, uh, this anti-terrorism issue, and the first thing that they, they identif identify, um, they would like to identify is that, yes, IS named as one of their um, resented countries. So we are, we are their target, we're on their list. So we are keenly aware of that fact. Um, in, in, the, in light of that labeling of China on the list, and in light of the, um, what the Chinese will label the Uyghur terrorist acts or um, violent attacks inside, inside China domestically, Chinese would like to, the Chinese government would like to enhance its cooperation with other countries or countries that face a similar threats or similar um, security challenges to enhance their cooperation, especially at this stage, I would say it has mostly stayed on the technical level. For example, in Afghanistan, China is interested in collaborating with the United States on anti-terrorism, on counter-terrorism. But one issue that China is mostly interest, is most interested in is intelligence sharing and sharing local assets and having a knowledge of how U.S. has operated counter-terrorism counter in the past more than a decade. So from China's perspective, there's a lot to learn on the te technical level. And I would say that the cooperation at this stage probably will focus on those technical issues, at least from the Chinese perspective. For China to send troops is going to be extremely unlikely because um, the Chinese will also do the cost-benefit analysis and see that, well, so far, IS has named us their target, but they have not really attacked us. But if we do anything more than required, or if we do anything prematurely, then we may as well turn us into a bigger target for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the fundamentalist groups. So China would like to avoid that, uh, that situation. I'll stop there. Hey, last word, South China yes, I mean, Luckily, I, I have a hard time connecting protection of Chinese nationals to the South China Sea. Actually, when we were at, at Shangri-La, the big talk was, of course, uh, at the conference one and a half month ago where we launched the book. I thought it was a good countercurrent to discuss something else in South China Sea, and that was what we did with our book uh, when we presented that. So uh, I don't think there are a lot of, of, of Chinese nationals on uh, these sort of small rocks and shoals to uh, protect. There might be in the future. Um, on China's uh, fight against terrorism, I think China would have loved to continue, which they managed successfully for very many years, to sort of stay low and not be on, on the sort of list, even though they have their own sort of um, uh, homegrown uh, extremism, uh, uh, Muslim issue in, in, in Xinjiang, and they are now on it. So I think that will gradually make some uh, changes. And I think uh, 
in protection of nationals. Where we look at it here, I think it's with um, terrorism has definitely made that the Ministry of Public Security has come on to also the international stage as a much stronger uh, actor. So I think you will see them in a way, in, in a maybe slightly different way than the sort of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is very embedded into sort of ways of, of uh, classical ways of doing non-interference, of, of doing cooperation uh, abroad and, and probably be sort of less inhibited. I think in the new uh, sort of anti-terrorism law, uh, which is in second reading or is about to be adopted, um, actually does leave the open the opportunity for, for sort of Chinese uh, operations uh, abroad in, uh, in order to, uh, to protect against terrorist uh, threat. So I think the link there is uh, is definitely there, and that's that's also going to be a, a driver. Great. Well, uh, please join me in thanking Yoon and Jonas for. Uh, <laughs>